uh, a very important subject related to patient health and safety performance, how we can protect employees and our organizations and our businesses, so to make sure there will be no injury and no ill health. So we're going to look at the benefits of implementing occupational health and safety management system, the structure of ISO 45001 2018, and how they link with the uh, ISO standard management system. Uh, my name is Mohamed Fawaz. I will be with you for this session. Some of you have attended the previous sessions on uh, business continuity management system this morning. Uh, I have been in this business for the last 35 years, so hopefully you will enjoy it and you will be able to understand concept, the basic concepts of occupation health and safety management system. So what is an occupation health and safety management system? Procedure and records, structured and framework for managing your occupation health and safety needs. Lots of document, structure for managing health and safety risk and improving health performance. So basically, it's not about documentation, it's not about procedures, it's not about just a bunch of documents that we need to put in place. What we need to put in place is a system that will help us improve our occupational health and safety performance. So basically, when we talk about health and safety performance, we are talking about prevention of injury and ill health. So in every organization, wherever we work, incidents might happen. And incidents might lead to injury or ill health. And we need to be very careful here. It's not safety. A lot of companies we visit and we audit, we see a lot of the documentation they have, they say safety first. That's very nice. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not about safety only. It's about safety and health. So we need to be careful. Safety is different than health. They are most important, but they are not the same. So safety of people is to make sure there will be no injuries. Ill health means injuries may lead to ill health. But ill health means on the long term. So someone may be working somewhere and they might be uh, developing illness, okay, over time. So for example, you are working in a noisy place, over time you might lose your capability of hearing. So you might be working in a place where they have a lot of uh, particles, with time you might have a cancer. Uh, you might be working in a place where you are always sitting First time you might be developing a disc or a back pain. So ill health is very important. Injuries, you can see it easily. If there is an incident and someone is injured, you can see there might be bleeding, it might have a fraction, it might have something that we can see easily. So that's injury and that's safety issues. But ill health is something we don't see. So for example, today was the COVID-19, you might meet someone to them and they might have COVID-19 and then you don't feel it for the next 21 days. So you are developing an illness but it will not show, symptoms will not be there until after a certain time. So what are the precautions that we need to be put in place to make sure we don't develop injuries and we don't have injuries and we don't have health. So basically uh, also we have legislations and legal requirements in many places related to uh, occupation health and safety management system. A lot of countries, they have acts on how to deal with health and safety. Example, today, many countries, because of COVID-19, they have restriction on working. Not every business can open, but those businesses that are allowed to open, they must follow all the regulations related to occupation health and safety systems. So in Canada, for example, if you are allowed to open as a business, okay, but you are allowed under the condition that you meet all the legal requirements, including Occupational Health and Safety Act. 
and definitely Ministry of Health regulations, Ministry of Health guidance uh, during this difficult time. So that's the purpose of occupational health and safety management system is to improve our occupational health and safety performance in terms of injuries, in terms of ill health. Okay. Any question until now? If you have any questions, any uh, clarification you need, please feel free to go ahead and send a chat or a question. Okay, how did occupational health and safety management system evolve? Over time, a lot of people and organizations, they find that they have injuries and that they are paying for those injuries. And their insurance premium is in increasing. So because you know all companies, they don't have insurance for health insurance. So what you have, when you have injuries, and insurance companies will increase your premium so you pay more because of injuries. So many organizations, workers and laborers organization, lobbied for legislation to protect workers. And legislations in regards to health and safety started in the year 1900. So because many companies were paying money. When you pay money, then you start thinking, how can I save this money? And because saving it is to prevent injuries and ill health, so they work on that. First issue that you need to remember in any system, an occupational health and safety management system, is that employees, they have rights that they need to have, and we need to understand as management. First right is the right to know. Right to know what are the hazards and risks related to their health and safety where they are working. So I'm working in a place, so what are the hazards and risks that I might be faced with the environment where I'm working? So I have the right to know, and management is supposed to tell me about those. I have the right to participate as an employee in setting policies and objectives and systems for controlling and mitigating and minimizing the hazards and risks that might cause health and safety issues. So I have the right to participate in setting controls and setting policies, objectives in the system. And the employee have the right, has the right to refuse to do the job if they think, employees, that there, there, are no enough, there are no enough controls in place to protect them from any health or safety issues or health and safety risks. Of course, once we show them that the controls are in place, they have to do their job. They cannot refuse doing it because all, all jobs are risky jobs. But if there are controls, we do our job. If there are no controls, then we have the right to refuse to say, I'm not doing my job because I cannot do it. That's fine, okay. Uh, raise the blue line. Okay, that's fine. A study was done in 1969 on a study was done in 1969 on occupational accident by the insurance company of North America. Uh, studied 1,753,498 accident at 297 organizations all in different types of occupational establishment, covered 1,750,000 employees working more than 3 billion hours over the period. And they got a result, 130, 110,30,600. That's the result of showing that for every 600 incident was no visible injury or damage, something we call near accident or close call or unsafe act and conditions or near miss, okay, for every 600 near misses, okay, 600 incident with no visible injury or damage, you will have 30 property damage accident, all types, and 10 minor injuries, and one serious or major injury or fatality. So it's a very important that we report any near miss in our organization. Near misses means that you as an employee might have been exposed to an incident, but nothing happened to you. So you don't report that. 
Next day, another employee might be exposed to the same incident, but something happened. Have you, if you report the near miss that you have been exposed to, then it will be very easy for the organization to deal with it and prevent someone else from being injured or having this incident. Okay? So the fundamentals of occupational hazard and safety management system start with hazard and then risk. What is hazard? The hazard is very simple. It's a very simple definition is the source of the risk. The hazard is the source of the risk. Is any situation, any activity, any event that might harm the employee and lead to a risk. So by simple definition, the hazard is the source of the risk. The risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. What are our objectives in a health and safety system? Our objectives is to eliminate injuries or, pre sorry, prevent injuries and prevent ill health. So the risk is any effect of an uncertainty that will not allow us to prevent injuries and ill health. So the hazard is the source of the risk. The risk is what could happen to you in terms of injury and ill health. So what are the type of hazards? So we have two types of hazards, health hazards and safety hazards. They are all the same, chemical, physical, economic, biological, and psychosocial hazards. So chemical hazards for health, inks and paints, solvents, oils and lubricants, you can get, get diseases, so irritants, asthma, skin disease, physical, like radiation, cancer, noise, hearing loss, drills, vibration, white finger, ergonomic hazards, poor posture, back pain, repetitive work, and poor lightning, biological hazards, infection from bacteria, molds, yeast, fungi, asthma, viruses, infections, psychosocial hazards, work-life balance, stress, family problems, alcohol abuse, and lifestyle smoking. So as you can see, we have chemical hazard, physical hazard, ergonomic hazards, biological hazard, psychosocial hazards, and we have sometimes also something called botanical hazards, hazard related to plants and related to vegetables and things like that, flowers and whatsoever. So those hazards can cause health issues or health risk and, and cause at the same time safety risks. So safety hazards, chemicals, spills, spills and trips, flashes, burns fumes, eye injuries, physical, electricity, electrocution, machinery, trailing leads, slips and trips, ergonomic, overstretching, upward posture, twisting and dropping loads, biological, loss of contaminant, air conditioning, human to human and indirect transmission, like today was the COVID-19, that's human to human, and indirect transmission of the disease. Psychosocial uh, hazard, for safety, losing concentration through fatigue, ignoring key control, and working with public violence. So as you can see, the same source of risk, those hazards, chemical hazards, physical hazards, economic hazards, biological hazards, psychosocial hazards, they can either cause safety risk or they can cause health risk. And we need to be careful and deal with both safety and health risk in the organization, not only safety. As I said earlier, Many organizations, they deal mainly with safety issues and they forget to deal with the health issues in the organization. Any question? Anyone has any question, any clarification needed until now? Someone is asking, uh, can we say hazard is anything that has the potential to cause danger? Yeah, to cause harm. Okay, in the language of the ISO 45001, we call it harm. Okay, any harm. Yeah, and it's the source of the risk, source of a harm, harmful thing that might happen to someone. Okay, cause danger. Okay, you want to call it danger, it's fine. In the standard, they call it harm. Any other question? Lose of safety leads to injury. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, safety will lead to injury. Injury is related to safety, but we want to make sure that also will not lead to health issues to illness. 
illness over time. That's very important to remember to, to think about illness over time. So once we identify the hazard, we need to analyze it, see what risk. So the typical risk assessment step in any organization, identify the hazard, meaning the source of the risk, identify the people at risk, who is going to be at risk because of that hazard. We assess the risk. Assessing means analyze and evaluate the risk, okay? Quantify and qualify. Then we see what controls we have. If we don't have controls, we add controls. Then we record and review when, re when required. So review means monitoring, measuring, and we need communication. So steps are easy. You identify the hazard, you identify the people at risk, you analyze the risk, assess the risk, evaluate the risk, see what controls you need to put in place. You put the controls and you have records for that and you review those things from time to time. Identification of hazard is something that you do all the time. It's not something that you do one time and you forget about it. Uh, in this business of health and safety, you need to look at what are the legislation that you need to worry about, uh, legal and other requirements that you need to worry about to make sure that you are following those legal and other requirements, such as acts, health and safety regulation, codes of practice, standards and guidance notes. So the standard talks about legal and other requirements. Legal requirements like coming from Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of uh, any ministry that has to do with health and safety. They have regulations that you need to follow. And then you may have good, good of practice. For example, the International Labor Organization, they might have a uh, code of practice or some other uh, obligations that government has signed for uh, with the United Nations. And you have standards and guidance. Sometimes your customer or your supplier may have some of their own requirements. Okay, you have uh, all the precautions that you need to put, for example, for chemicals like safety data sheets for any the materials you are using in the organization. Now, legal compliance versus conformance with ISO 45001. Compliance means you comply with the legal requirements. Compliance means that the organization is meeting the requirements of legislation or a contract or a standard. Conformance in management system terms is that the system is being followed correctly without deficiency, has the terminology non-conformity when there is a deviation from the system specified requirement. So conformity is for systems that we put for ourselves. Compliance is for legal requirement that we are obliged to follow and implement. Now, we talked about the uh, pyramid 630.10.1, and we say for every 600 near miss, there is 30 property damage and minor injuries and one fatality. So. In the standard, they use the word incident, okay? They don't talk about accident, they use the word incident. An incident is any event that might lead to a harm or not. So incident is anything that you might face that could lead to something harmful for you or may not lead to something harmful. If it leads to injury or any harmful issues, we call it accident. So the incident is accident. If it doesn't cause any harm, we call it near miss. Both accident and near miss are incidents. Both accident and near miss are someone will add. Both Accident and near miss are called incidents. And we have another type of incident, which is the emergency situation. When we have an emergency situation that we need to deal with. Any question concerning the understanding of incident and the standard? The standards talks about incident. Incident is three part. Accident leading to a harm, near miss, not causing any harm, but is an incident, and emergency situation, emergency situation that might happen, potential emergency situation, it's an incident. So we need to make sure that we understand the definition of incident in our business. In regards to ISO 45001. 
And when we have incident, we need to do incident. The standard talks about doing incident investigation. We adopt joint approach. We have a procedure about incident investigation in, the stand, in, in our organization. Investigate in a timely manner. Whenever there is an incident, we do it right away. Be open, honest, and objective. Avoid blame. Investigate the root cause. Very important to know what is the root cause of the problem of the incident because once we know the root cause, we can make sure it will not happen again in the future. So we, we gather information, we analyze the information, we gather information, we analyze the information, and then we put the risk control measures, we do action plan and implementation. Now here we need to understand one thing. In the risk assessment we do for hazards, we do have before and after. The risk assessment we do is to make sure that we put controls to prevent the risk from happening. But then we have also put in place what we did, the controls we put in place to prevent the risk from happening is called the proactive controls. So the before, so something will not happen. But we do also need to have a reactive issue. If the incident happened, what is our reactive, what are our reactive measures? how we deal with it, how we react with the incident if it happens. So we need to make sure we have in our company controls to prevent risk from happening, incidents from happening. But also we have controls in place and reactive measures in place to deal with the incident if it happens. So, and many companies, when they put the risk assessment, they forget that. They only uh, put controls that will help them prevent something from happening, but they forget to put responses and measures to deal with a, a problem if it happens. So the ISO 45001 standard is similar to any management system standard uh, developed by ISO. It would have the same structure and uh, sections uh, or 10 clauses, they call it sometimes. Clause one is the scope, provides context and background, why we implement ISO 45001. So the scope of the standard we implemented to improve our occupation health and safety performance. Set policy, objectives, programs, everything. The scope implemented to make sure that we improve our occupation, health, and safety performance by preventing injuries and ill health. Clause two is normative reference. There is no normative reference in the standard. Clause three, terms and definitions. In the ISO 45001-2018, you have a lot of terms and definitions that you need to understand. Uh, definitions for hazard, for risk, for likelihood, for consequences, for system, for incident, for corrective action, for non-conformity, for top management, for competence. All these things are in place in the standard as definitions. Why we need those definitions? Because when we are implementing a management system standard developed by ISO, we don't go by the definition of a term used in the standard from a dictionary. We use the definition in the standard. So we have to make sure that we use a definition from the standard not the definition in the dictionary, because you might read the word incident and go find the definition of incident in the dictionary, for example, Cambridge Dictionary, and they might give you a definition. But definition in ISO 45001 might be different. So we go by the definition given in ISO 45001 and not by the definition given in the dictionary. That's very important to remember when it comes to definitions. So the structure of the standard we have 10 clauses, scope, normative reference, terms and definitions, section four, context of the organization, section five, leadership and worker participation, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, improvement. It's the same thing as any other management system standard developed by ISO. It's based on plan to check act. Section four and five and six are planning. Section eight is doing. Section nine is checking, 
and section 10 is improvement. And section seven, the support is used for all the four. Seven support, we need the support for planning, we need it for doing, we need it for checking, and we need it for acting. Any question until now? Anyone has any clarification needed? Any question? Okay, some people are asking, again, definition, the incident. I'm going to repeat. In ISO 45001, 2018, they have a term called incident. And what they mean by incident, they mean by incident, any event that might be, you might, employee might be exposed to, and that event could lead to harm or may not lead to harm. If it leads to harm, they call it accident. If it doesn't lead to harm, they call it near miss. But both accident and near misses are called incidents in the standard. I hope this is clear. Any question about uh, incident? Okay. In the ISO world, management system standards, any management system standard, they are basing all the system on processes. Here is one uh, figure on how you make processes. This is called turtle diagram. Turtle diagram, like a turtle. So whenever you have a process, you will need for this process people. You need input. You need output. Process is interaction of activities that will transform inputs into outputs. So we need the inputs, to get outputs. And to get the outputs, we will need people to do the job. We need materials, equipment, and physical environment, what and where. And we need the methods, how, and we need to measure results. So a process will get output, the output will get results. And so we need the who, we need the what and the where, we need the how, and we need the results, okay? So it's very important that the, all these W's and H, but I call them sometimes six wives and one husband. Okay, this is a new religion now. Uh, so the six wives are the why, the what, the when, the where, the who, and the what if, and the husband is the how. So we need people, and people must be competent. We need method, risk assess, second step, documentation, and we need uh, materials, infrastructures, buildings, hierarchy of controls, hardware, software, and then we have output, finished good or services, result data, unharmed workers, suitability, acceptability, controlled hazard, and the result defined and accurate, performance trends, audit, corrective action. That's a very interesting uh, way of seeing the process approach in the organization. Any question until now? I have no question, we can continue. So this is based on, as I said, the standard is based on plan, do, check, act. So the clauses 4.1 and 4.2 are related to planning. Five is plan, if six is planning. Five is the leadership needed for all of them. And then you have support and operation doing eight and checking is nine and acting is 10. So this is for all standard today, all management system standard developed by ISO will have the same structure, one to 10. So 45,000 as a risk-based thinking determine the business risk, which can affect ability and occupation health and safety performance. So six plan how to address these risks. So from four, we go to six to develop the risk related to the system. So section four, context of the organization. It's like all other standards, you need to have 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4. Understanding the organization and its context. Here we are talking about internal and external issues related to occupational health and safety. Okay, so for example, internally, do we have clear signs in the organization? So we're talking about health and safety. Do we have uh, our infrastructure in the organization in terms of physical hazards, all sources of physical hazards like electricity, for example, okay? Are they properly 
managed, are properly protected, okay? Or physical hazards could be from slip and trips. Do we have precautions for slip and trip? So we look at our context internally, transportation, movement of vehicles inside the organization, how it is done, is it done properly or not? So we look at our internal context, do we have a policy for health and safety? Do we have objectives for health and safety? So we kind of doing a gap assessment on our internal system in regards to health and safety compared to the requirement of ISO 45001. So we can do SWOT analysis, we can look at weaknesses and, uh, and strengths and threats and opportunities. But at the same time, we, can, we need to make sure that we look at what we have internally as compared to the requirement of 45001 uh, requirements on health and safety. Sometimes we call this kind of an initial review, initial review of our system of what we have in regards to health and safety. The external context, all the legal requirements is very important in the health and safety context. Look at external context, look at the legal requirements that we need to follow and comply with in regards to health and safety for our employees. They, in the standard, they don't call it employee, they call it worker. And worker means everything, everyone in the organization. So what are the legal requirements to protect workers? And workers includes people working for us in the organization and any visitor, any contractor, any outsource activity, also the, those, those are people that we need to worry about. So when we look at the context that we have externally, we look, do we have any outsource activity? Do we have any suppliers we deal with? What are the legal requirements, technology that are used? Okay, so these are the context. If when we look at the context, we discover that something is not working, then we look at how to control that and these become risks that we need to worry about in our business. Understanding the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. You can notice here in the 45001, they don't say only understanding the needs and expectation of interested parties. They say understanding the needs and expectation of workers and other interested parties. Even though workers are supposed to be interested parties, but they make it sure to put workers separately Make sure to tell everyone in the organization from top management down that we care about worker, workers. This standard is about protecting workers. So they had to put workers separately from the other interested parties, emphasize it more, and make sure it's very well highlighted so we all understand that we are talking about workers here more than anything else. So we look at those interested parties and workers and what workers want. And we talked earlier that workers, they have three rights. Right, no. So the first needs of the worker is, uh, the first needs of the workers is for them to know what are the hazards and risks related to their job. So I'm doing a job. What are the hazards and risks related to my job? And can I do it? And do I, do I have enough controls in place so I can do that job without, some, without being harmed or injured? Or coming ill over time. Other interested parties, management, insurance companies, bank, authorities, society, neighbors, all these are interested parties that we need to worry about and we need to know what are their requirements. Determining the scope of the health and safety management system is the same thing, boundaries where the system will be implemented, in which area the system will be implemented. Now it's not easy to say in one organization, for example, under the same roof, that I'm going to implement this in one place, not implement it in other place. For example, if you have a company that they have an office, they have a head office and they have a plant, and the plant is not at the same place at the head office. So I see some companies, they say we want to implement health and safety in the factory or in the plant but you do not want to implement it in the head office, in the offices, the administration. Why? I mean, the people working in the administration they are also workers that need to be protected. So why we don't want to implement it there? It would be very hard to accept such uh, issue. It would be very hard for someone to accept from a company that they want to implement 
the occupation hazard and safety management system only in the factory or only in the site, but not in the administrative offices. That would be not acceptable because people working for the organization are also in the head office are also workers. They need to be protected. 4.4 is the processes that we need to have in place to deal with occupation health and safety management system. So we already explained all those. We don't need okay. leadership and worker participation. So clause number five is about leadership. 5.1 leadership and commitment. We want to see that leaders of the organization are committed to health and safety. How do we know that a leader is committed? One way of knowing that the top management of the organization is committed to occupation health and safety and to protect employees and protect workers and protect the well-being well -being of the workers is providing resources. So they provide the resources, they provide the training for the workers, so workers can be uh, well aware of what's going on and well protected. Okay. So leadership is very important. So top management encourages and promotes a focus on occupational health and safety. Fulfill obligations as stated in 45001. Encourage leaders to implement requirements, create preventive and effective culture. So create a culture of, of health and safety in the organization. So managing occupational health and safety in integral is integral to managing the business on day-to-day -day basis. So all the processes for health and safety are integrated within the business processes of the organization and that's the role of top management they provide the resources needed for that now the worker participation is part of one second worker participation is part of the leadership how leaders will ensure worker participation it depends on the country in some countries they have legal requirements specifying that for every company that has more than 25 employees it must have a joint committee on health and safety. And that committee must include representatives from management and workers. So here workers will participate in the system. So to make sure that workers are participating, we need to have health and safety committee, the joint health and safety committee where workers will participate in this committee and provide their needs, and their expectations. Uh, health and uh, safety policy, it's important to have a policy that will support the strategic direction of the organization. The policy will have commitments. The health and safety policy will have commitment to prevent injury and ill health, commitment to comply with legal and other requirements, commitment to improve the occupation health and safety performance. So we have three commitments in the policy. Commitment to prevent injury and ill health, commitment to comply with legal and other requirements and commitment to improve the performance of our health and safety system. That's very important and the policy shall be available to interested parties, including workers. Roles and responsibilities and authorities. Here we are talking about the roles of people managing the health and safety system. In some countries, they have rules that for every organization that has more than 25 employees, it must have a position called health and safety officer or health and safety manager. So we need to have someone in charge of health and safety, someone appointed by top management from top management to manage health and safety system, and not one person. So one person and we might have many other people. So we need to have a hierarchy of responsibilities. What are the responsibilities of top management in health and safety? What are the responsibilities of employees in health and safety? What are the responsibilities of, ma of managers, supervisors, of the health and safety manager, of the uh, health and safety representative in every department? What are their responsibilities and authorities? For example, top management responsibility is to provide resources, is to train people, is to be committed, okay? Is to be accountable for the results. So if something happened, it's the top management accountability. They are accountable for the result if there, are accident, if there are incident in the organization. And they provide the resources and they train people on health and safety. Now, what are the responsibility of employees is to participate, is to be consulted, 
is to give uh, is to give the uh, needs and is to implement the system okay make sure that employees they're implementing the system they are aware of what, is, what are the consequences of not implementing the system so that's very important that we have roles and responsibility in regards to health and safety it's not roles and responsibility in authorities in regards to the job we do daily it's the roles and responsibility of authorities in regards to health and safety for example if we say for example that we we have uh, a spill kit we might have a spill chemical spillage for example who's going to clean the spillage if it happens so we need to specify that not just say okay we have a spill procedure if there is a spill there's a procedure how to do it but who's going to do the cleaning who's going to go and clean the area if there's a spillage so we have a for example uh, an area where we have dust okay who is going to be in, in charge to make sure that people are giving PPEs, uh, personnel protective equipment? Today, all see that because of COVID-19, COVID all people, they have PPEs, the personnel protective equipment. Who is in charge to give personal protective equipment? Okay, we need to test the health of employees from time to time. Who's going to do the test? Do we have a doctor to do that? Or do we have an agreement with the hospital to do that? So there are responsibilities and authorities that are different from the normal day-to-day -day operation we do when we are implementing health and safety. Suppose someone is injured. Who is responsible to go and rescue that injured person? Do we have a rescue team? Are they trained, this rescue team? So it's very important to have these roles and responsibility clear. What about emergency situation? If there's an emergency, who will deal with the emergency? Who is the authorized person to deal with emergency? Who will take the decision for the how to deal with the emergency? So these are roles, responsibilities, and authorities. They are not the same as the role and responsibility authority that we for our day-to-day -day operation. These are roles, responsibility, authorities related to the health and safety management system and the controls for health and safety. A consultation and participation of workers. Now, consultation and participation of workers, make sure that workers are involved in all aspects of the development, planning, implementation, monitoring, and improving of the health and safety system. In some countries, they have legal requirements that states that employees, they are allowed to do inspection on the infrastructure of the organization to make sure that they have proper infrastructure that will not lead to any harm so this is inspection done by done by employees themselves and not by management so this is for example done every three months every six months every one year on all the physical hazards chemical hazards biological hazards that are present in the organization ergonomic hazards for example employees and workers can go check on all the sitting chairs for example used by other employees are they ergonomic chairs or not ergonomic chairs? Are they appropriate chairs for people sitting in front of their computers or, and using their computer? So these are inspections done by, done by employees. So this is the involvement of workers in the system. They are involved in setting the system, implementing it, and in monitoring and improving it. They are not only involved in getting the information. So consultation, we ask for their opinion. Participation, they participate in the system so worker experience and knowledge is included in the health and safety management system and they are fully involved and that's very important because workers they have the experience and they will tell you what could happen because they have the experience and they have been doing this job for a long time Clause number six which is the uh, planning uh, this is action to address risk and opportunity and it has in it two things we need to look at risk and opportunity and we need to identify hazard and risk. So what are the sources of risk or threat? What could happen? Where it could happen? When it could happen? How it could happen? What are the causes? Why it happens? Causes? Business consequences if it happens? Business area stakeholders affected? And what control exists in place if they are effective or not effective? Now to identify risks, identifying hazards, identifying risk, have so many techniques brainstorming interviews checklists 
structured what if techniques, scenario analysis, fault tree analysis, bow tie analysis, direct observation, incident analysis survey. So you may select any of these techniques. Of course, we will give more sessions later on on risk identification techniques and risk assessment techniques for those people who are interested. Okay, because it's, we cannot explain it now in details, but these are some of the techniques used in identifying hazards and identifying risks. Okay, so, and once you identify hazard uh, and you, you identify the risk related to the hazard, you need to assess it in terms of likelihood and consequences. Here is, for example, matrix of likelihood of consequences. So what is the likelihood of a risk happening? Rare, unlikely, moderate, likely, almost certain. And what are the consequences if it could happen? Significant, minor, moderate, major, catastrophic. Now, when you put those terminologies of likelihood and consequences, you need to define it. So rare means once every 100 years, unlikely once every 10 years, moderate once every year, likely once every month, almost certain once every day. Consequences, insignificant, no harm, minor, for example, one hour off work or uh, first aid needed, moderate, maybe two days off work injuries, major, maybe a reversible injury, someone who could have a major injury, but as a reversible injury, could take maybe one year or two years of work, catastrophic, someone will die. So we need to define those terms, likelihood and consequences. We have to give them operational definition. So rare, unlikely, moderate, likely, almost certain. What are the operation definition for this? Consequences, significant, minor, moderate, major, catastrophic. We also need to give operational definition for those things that we are put here in place. And once we have that, we use this matrix as our risk criteria to identify priorities in our organization. Objectives and planning need to put uh, health and safety objectives and make sure we have a plan to achieve them. In the support section, clause number seven, we have the resources needed, people, infrastructure, work environment, competence. The competence here is not the competence in doing your day-to-day -day work, but is the competence in dealing with the hazard and the risk. So if there is a hazard and the risk, are you competent with dealing with it? And the competency in using the controls for the hazard and risk. So competence in the sense of we need to be trained in the risk. So when you finish the hazard identification risk assessment, you will have something called the risk register. In this risk register, you will have the controls and you train people on the controls. So people are supposed to be competent on those controls from the risk register. Awareness is to explain to people why, why they need to implement health and safety and what are the consequences if they do not do that. Communication is you communicate with them about the policy, objective, legal requirements, and controls and procedures. Documented information, these are the documents that you need to do this. So resources, competence, awareness, communication, document information. Operation, we have in operation 8.1, operation planning, when we put all the hazards and the risk and the controls in place. And the hierarchy of controls that you need to put, uh, eliminate the hazard. If I can eliminate the source of the hazard, then I'm eliminating the risk. Substitute something. For example, if you are using chemicals, you may substitute it by less hazardous chemical. Engineering controls, guards, local exhaust ventilation, reorganization of work, administrative control, signage, instruction, warnings, training, restricting exposure, and PPE, personal protective equipment, which is the last resort in the list of hierarchy of controls. So we have elimination, substitution, and we have isolation, part of engineering control, isolation of the risk in the place. So some companies, they think that they are giving employees PPEs and it's enough, it's not enough. PPEs are the last resort, are there to help them protect themselves if the incident happened. But we need to first make sure that the incident does not happen. Management of change, we need to have a procedure for management of change and procurement. When you procure, make procurement and out, contracting and outsourcing, you need to control them to make sure they do not cause any harm. Emergency preparedness and response. The difference between the normal incident and the emergency is the normal incident, we might have time to deal with it. The 
emergency, we cannot have time to deal with it. We have to act immediately. We have to attend to it immediately. So we make a list of all emergencies that might happen, all disruptions that might happen, all uh, uh, disasters that might happen. And for every emergency, potential emergency, we make a response plan, an action plan, what we will do if this emergency happened with hierarchy of controls, with hierarchy of responsibilities, with resources needed, with communication plan, and take it into consideration like uh, holidays and weekends, and night shift, or, or emergency that might happen at night. So, because it could happen during vacation and holidays. Performance evaluation, as we do monitor and measure the system and we do internal audit and we do management review and the last thing we have in the system is the improvement control of non-conformity incident investigation and improvement has incident investigation non-conformity and corrective action in place this is in summary in very brief summary the occupation health and safety management system based on ISO 45001. Still have about eight minutes to finish the session today. If you have any question, any clarification you need, please feel free to go and ask. And there's a question here about consequence in the risk assessment. Should we clarif clarify and identify on safety? And yes, we have to separate health consequences from safety consequences. We need to put both. If there is a risk and we have a likelihood of happening, if it happens, the risk, if it happens, it has consequences on health and on safety and we need to separate both of them. We, can, we have to make sure this is safety consequences and this is health consequences, yes. Uh, uh, some people ask a question, you use leadership and top management, what difference between them here? But, the, top, the leadership is from the top management. We are talking about the top management to have leadership. For the top management to be a leader, okay? So to, to activate leadership, practice leadership by top management, okay? Leadership is for anyone, not only top management. Any manager, any employee can have leadership. But we expect leadership to come first from top management. So they act as, as leaders, motivate people, help them achieve their uh, best, achieve their objective. That's what, that's what we're talking about. But, uh, okay. Okay, another question about health and safety. When we do the risk assessment, we have the section 8.2 about procurement outsourcing contractors we need to do risk assessment about anyone visiting us. So the risk related to visitors accessing our premises. We need to protect everyone in our premises. So sometimes we have something called countdown. Anyone enter the premises, they must put their name, what time they enter, to whom they can, and they must be escorted. They cannot just go by themselves in the organization. So we need to make sure we control their behavior. Is it necessary to use a consultant to identify emergencies or hazard or whatsoever, it's up to you as an organization. If you have enough uh, competency in place to identify hazard, you may not need consultant, you may need just training. But if you do not have enough competency, you might need consultant to help you. And then sometimes you might even need consultant to help you, even if you have the competency, because you don't have enough time to do it, so you, you get help from outside, uh, from consultant to help you. And from my opinion, uh, you need both. Best, best combination is to rely on your people internally, but also have some facilitators to facilitate the job. Because if you do not have someone from outside to facilitate it, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, someone has a question on uh, occupation health and safety key performance indicators. Yes. Uh, as objective, can we have an example? But see, performance indicators, for example, uh, the, your objective is to reduce incidents. A performance indicator would be, for example, a number of incidents 
that has happened for the last year in a certain place. For example, spills. Okay, you, you have a control not having spills. So you can have a performance indicator, how many spills we had over the last year, okay? So number of spills will give you a performance indicator if your system is working, is effective or not effective, okay? So that's, that could be a performance indicator. Now, number of injuries could be your performance indicator also. Total number of injuries over total number of employees, total number of last time uh, work at place over the total number of hours that are working, so you can do. Use of computer at work, yeah, there's a hazard. That's an ergonomic hazard and biological hazard. Yeah, does have an um, impact on your eyes. That's biological hazard, yes. And there are uh, many controls that you can use to protect your eyes from the computer. To what uh, level of details, the documentation that need to be prepared, we don't need to details because to keep simple, what is your suggestion? Well, you have to make sure that you have enough details so you can preserve the know-how and you have to make sure that the, the documents is user friendly so people can use it. If you have too many documentation, people may not use it. And if you don't have too many documentation also, you might lose some know-how in the organization. So you need to have a balance between know-how, competency, and, uh, and uh, making sure that people will be able to use the documentation. Any other question? Yes, there's one uh, just shared right now. Which one? About third parties accessing the workplace. I just explained it. If third party accessing the workplace, we have no control over their behavior, cannot enforce or proceed to them, such as government entities frequently accessing the courtyard. Well, okay. <laughs> this is a tricky question. <laughs> All right. When they, they get, well, you, you do your due diligence and your minimum. You can send, you can communicate with them your system of health and safety for the government entity. They enter the courtyard. You know them, you identify them, you send them your system, you send them your policy, send them what is required from them when they enter the place, and you try to educate them. With time, they will understand and then they will follow. Now, if they don't follow, you have done your due diligence, you have sent them what's required, and you have shared it with them, okay, then now it's, it, it's going to be their responsibility if they don't follow. But when they enter, you can at least have someone from your place with them to be always with them to make sure they don't make any mistake. Do you think that health and safety procedure uh, Well, actually, you know, every time you have something new, go back, that's why we have a procedure for management of change. Every time you have something new happening, go back to your system and you see, have you taken this into consideration in your system? Yes, of course, we need to go and, but if we follow the same procedures, we can protect ourselves from coronavirus. Because as I said, protecting employees from any health hazards, okay? So we know this is a hazard, the coronavirus. We have a system in place and our employees will follow health and safety system that we have in place and will be protected from coronavirus. Actually, if you look, for example, in Canada, uh, the government has issued uh, uh, the list of businesses that can open. And in the, that list, they say, you can open provided to follow Occupation Health and Safety Act. Because they know if you follow Occupation and Safety Act, uh, then you can be protected from coronavirus. Of course, you need to change something, it will be much more easier if you have a system. Is there an evaluation from the judge the about the risk before? Him? From to judge the organization? Yeah, when, whenever you decide on a risk that you want to put in place, you need to evaluate. Whenever you put a uh, control for the risk, I guess the control for the risk you, you mean by the question, you need to assess that control. Is it going to work or not? Yes, you need to evaluate the control before you implement it. Because you might have a control in place for certain risk, and that control could present another hazard, or another risk. So you need to make sure that control will not cause any new risks. Are you willing to give us a... Oh, I, well, yeah, probably we can give you a certificate. Why not? Yes. 
Okay, I mean, this is we don't usually issue certificates for free sessions, but if someone really needs it, so, uh, we can send you an email that you have attended the cert. Uh, and the email is enough. We can send you an email. Once you receive an email that you have attended the session and you receive the presentation, that would be enough evidence that you have attended. Can we, well, yeah, the, the web can give you a lot of uh, procedures. Yes, you can. Yes, emergency situation includes war, include uh, explosions, include uh, higher, include uh, hurricanes, include uh, all these things, uh, everything, yeah, earthquake, all these things are included in the emergency plan, yes. Yes, we will share the PowerPoint, sure. How can we save our employees if they are working at hospital inside the kitchen? It's the hospital that will have infection control system. So they work in the hospital inside the kitchen. The kitchen will have a has the kitchen must have a HACCP system. Uh, which is uh, something for the food safety management system. And the hospital must have a system in place to protect them. Yes, they should do this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have exceeded our time. And hopefully we can see you. We will have other sessions. Do have other sessions, uh, uh, free sessions on uh, risk management, I guess, next week. And we have uh, sessions on inf information security management system. And we have sessions on uh, ISO 14000. And we have sessions on food safety management system. So please look at the list of, uh, probably Kassim can send you a list of our free sessions for next week and the and, uh, and in May and in June. And we'll be repeating those sessions more often. And we will have also courses on the same subject for more details for those of you that would like to have more details on the subject. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to leave now, if you, if you don't mind, and end the meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye.